God, I wish I could get promoted that far that quickly. Hi guys, I'm Phil. Welcome to my channel where I talk about all the geeky pop culture that I like to enjoy and consume, which of course includes Star Trek. I am a Trekkie. We're doing weekly reviews of Star Trek Discovery as it comes out. Um, and we, the, we're up to the episode that I probably was most anticipating just on the title alone. Unification Part 3. They are really going wild with the naming conventions this season, aren't they? Because uh, the opening of the season was a, I can't remember, uh, The Hope Is You Part 1, but there is no Part 2 in sight. And now we have a Part 3 to a story where Parts 1 and 2 were in another series 29 years ago. Absolutely wild. <laughs> But yeah, I was very much anticipating this episode, wondering what they were going to do with it. You know, were we going to see what we were going to see from the how it would tie into those first two parts back in the next generation? Um, obviously, Spock isn't around anymore, so it couldn't involve him. It probably wouldn't involve directly any of the players from that episode. So it would have to be a thematic thing. We probably all guessed that it would be something to do with the Balkans and the Romulans reunifying. But what we didn't know until we got the episode. I'm going to keep this one quite short because A, I've got a sleeping baby that might wake up at any moment and also I am going to be talking about this episode further tomorrow uh, on Friday evening on uh, Trek Lads live stream along with a load of other Trekkies so uh, do check out that for mine and others thoughts uh, a bit more in depth on this episode then. I'll leave a link in the description below. Now, in terms of naming it Unification Part 3, instead of just dealing with the fact that they had reunified, uh, I get why they did it, but it doesn't really feel like the Part 3 to that story for me. It feels like a sort of coda to it, in a kind of like, hey, look, 900 years later, this is, this is what the society, the unified society, we get a little glimpse at that. But it doesn't feel like it's part of the same story necessarily, because the story in this is very much Michael's story. So, uh, although the, it was, there were elements of it brushed on, and there were elements of the tension between the Vulcans and the Romulans still in this that you could see, and, and they did come up, uh, I'm not sure it feels like a part three. It more feels like a sort of, just like a coda to part part two it kind of feels a bit like we got that episode in season two of discovery where they revisit revisited um the telosians and it kind of feels like that that wasn't you know i can't remember what the original uh where no man goes whatever it was called the original tos pilot with pike part two it was its own episode and it kind of feels like maybe this should have been named that but I get why they did it for publicity reasons. Contrasted to last week this was a very much a slower paced talking episode you know last week I said it's very it was very action-packed and that is okay we can have the occasional action-packed as long as they are surrounded by the more thoughtful episodes as well and this I think was both a very much a character piece for Michael but also uh, a more uh, a sort of slower paced talking thoughtful we had a kind of like courtroom type esque feel that we've had in many Star Treks before and yeah I think on the whole it generally worked my general feelings of this episode is it was a good episode I liked it there were some grievances I have with it more towards the beginning but I thought some of the stuff towards the end of the I keep wanting to call it a trial. It's not a trial. It, I can't remember the word they use for it, but the the uh, sort of academic uh, presentation of Michael to try and win over the Navarans. Uh, the yeah, I think I think that there was some good stuff towards the end of that, uh, and some powerful stuff, especially for Michael's character. And yeah, it dealt with the the reunification, which is nice to know that Spock's work succeeded even many centuries after his death. I do like the fact that they seeded Spock's name in there very early on to sort of ground it in. I mean anybody would that had looked up or knew about the TNG episodes would know the kind of broad themes that this might brush on and the fact that it links into Spock 
but the fact that they just placed him in the dialogue very early on in an early scene between Michael and Booker, uh, I think was was handy for those that might not be aware sort of sets it up a little bit that was quite nice that scene between Michael and Booker as well did also set up as well as seeding Spock also set up a nice theme of the episode in terms of Michael's character development which was that she has put herself in a very sort of she sees herself as a very messianic figure she has a bit of a messiah complex she wants to be the one going out and saving everybody all the time and saving the universe that is very much something that uh we've seen and in fact we you know people have criticized her for but at least the show is acknowledging it and no the show just acknowledging it doesn't you know make it not you know if they carry on doing it it doesn't make it necessarily better but at least they are acknowledging it and I think something you know some of her personal growth later on in the episode some of the realizations she comes to about herself uh, go some way to make her realize that she doesn't have to do everything all by herself and sometimes there is a bigger a bigger thing out there more than just her and the idea of her having a messiah complex is developed further during the actual trial itself i keep calling it a trial it's not a trial you know what i mean uh during the ceremony during the the thing itself where she's giving her speeches and her specifically when her mum interjects and it feels like her mum's betraying her i haven't even mentioned that her mum comes back yet yeah her mum surprise i did not see that coming you know what are the chances that she would turn up in this episode yeah i think i think we all figured that maybe she would turn up eventually although i was kind of assuming that she due to the way the time hopping happened last season that she would be in a different timeline but apparently not but her mum brings up in when she's acting as her advocate but uh, is actually because she's this uh, of this um, join this romulan order of absolute candor nice call back to picard there we get her being very upfront and very truthful about Michael and laying down some home truths here. And she, at one point, she points out this sort of messiah complex to everybody there and indicates that it's probably her fault for abandoning her, for making her an orphan. She created a void that Michael felt like she needed to fill. And seeing Michael come to terms with that and maybe now having her mother back might start to fill in that void. And then you've got, you know, she's got Booker as well. That void might start getting filled by other things. So you, we might, hopefully, see Burnham. She's still the main character, so she's still going to be very important to a lot of plots. But maybe we'll see her take a step back from in-universe feeling like she needs to be the one to go out and save everyone. Talking of calling back to things like Picard, there were a lot of really good callbacks to previous shows here. We obviously got callbacks to the TNG episodes, Unification. There was a clip of um, Spock that came up in a hologram form. And that was a very touching moment, seeing Burnham react to how Spock had gone on and lived his life and the kind of things he had achieved, because up until that point, she hadn't looked him up. And just, it was, a, it was a nice touching moment, I thought. We get, obviously, the callback to Picard as well, with the Sisters of Absolute Candor, Volk uh, Romulan sect. There were mentions of the Temporal Accords, which obviously calls back to the Temporal Cold War and Enterprise. So there was a lot of, like, nice little links through to past series here. It really felt like an episode that was celebrating the franchise's past, which was really lovely. So on the unification front itself, as I said early on in, in the video, what I felt like was that this wasn't a part three to the existing story. This wasn't a part three to the unification story. But what we did get, it was interesting. I like what where they've taken this. The Vulcans and the Romulans are both living on what used to be Vulcan and is now called Navarre. And for anybody that still, for some reason, maintains that this is the Kelvin timeline, I think this definitively proves it's not. You know, Vulcan was blown up in the Kelvin timeline. This is not the Kelvin timeline. Uh, so anybody still going along that lines, you can stop now. 
but yeah i like the fact that they've got this sort of uneasy alliance between the two of them you've got these kind of different sections you've got the pure vulcans still there you've got the pure romulans and then you've got this third group which have clearly been interbreeding and there so there's there's a bit of a more of a mixture there but they're they've all got this one government um and i you know that seems to be like working out it seems to be the fulfillment of spock's dream but we see it put under pressure here from the simplest of things from the federation asking for some data and michael's request is so it sort of exposes the fault lines in this relationship between the vulcans and the romulans that has developed and then michael obviously feels she needs to withdraw her request for the data because it's exposing those fault lines and you know there are at risk of of descending back into sort of strife and dividing again and, and she's at risk of undoing the work that her brother put into unifying these two ancient cousins of you know races so she does the better thing and pulls out and of course she gets the data anyway so all works out well in the end for everyone i do hope we see more of the the vulcans and the romulans and, and navarre in general it would be nice to see, uh, especially as Vulcan was a founding member of the Federation. What was interesting, I found, was that the um, bit of information is dropped that actually the Vulcans were the ones that wanted to leave the Federation. And it was the Romulans wanting to stay in. So presumably by this point, Navarre was a Federation member with both Vulcans and Romulans being Federation citizens. And it was the Romulans that wanted to stay in, you know in in the federation which is their ancient enemy the federation that was formed initially out of the the fires of war against them and they're the ones that wanted to stay in which i thought was an interesting little tidbit we found out there so yeah this whole plot line i think gave uh, some a little bit of character development for burnham it was very burnham focused and there you know it, there was some good stuff from her there was some powerful sort of emotional beats that i think the the stuff with her mum and when her mum sort of seemingly goes against her despite being her advocate because of her commitment to absolute candor at, 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 which ends up helping her uh, i think those were the best scenes in the whole episode however i'm not without criticism of this plot line and so, with the way early on how it was handled and how michael's importance to it was handled yes i think her being Spock's sister is relevant and it makes absolute sense that therefore the Admiral would send her to, um, to to do this mission. But the way it was framed seemed to place her in a much more sort of... What was the way he phrased it? Oh yeah, send them a message. Michael Burnham is coming. Like, it was just a bit OTT and a bit... A bit like, okay, obviously Spock is a very important figure in the history of Navarre, but would they know that much about his sister, really? Would she be that famous? I mean, think of all the famous figures in history. How much do you know about their brothers and sisters? Probably not much. Would anybody even recognise the name? Yeah, they could look her up. But the way it was framed, I just think it could have been... And it's a small little thing, but it, it, it's it's playing into the messiah complex of burnham it's i think it's absolutely fine when i think it's quite an interesting character development that burnham has this messiah complex but it's it stretches the credibility a bit when everyone else buys into it as well and everybody else starts acting like she's the, you know the you know the messiah uh, she's the one the that can do everything i think when she thinks she can do everything I think that's fine and i think it's fine that sometimes she's right she is she can do it but i think sometimes the show itself plays it up a little bit too much and here especially in that line and early on in how it was framed was one of those occasions the b plot line of this episode was tilly being promoted to second in command from ensign that what a what a rise from ensign to second in command of the ship in one fell swoop oh god i wish i could do that at work <laughs> just suddenly be like in charge of everything that would be lovely wouldn't it um i thought this was a lovely scene there was very touching scenes uh and obviously she's 
concerned about it and worried and fretting and anxious about it because she's Tilly and that's what she does. And she goes to Stamets and initially I think Stamets is, because of the way his personality is, he reacts in a way that isn't particularly helpful and he says it would be weird taking orders from you. But And then he gets interrupted before he can clarify. But actually she, you know, there's this lovely touching scene at the end, although a little bit cheesy, admittedly, where he has gathered everyone together in the engineering department and they all tell her she should do it. And and yeah, it's cheesy where they all go, say yes, say yes, say yes, say yes. A little bit on the cheesy side for my liking, but it was still quite touching. So overall, I uh, thought it was an interesting episode. Like I say, it doesn't feel like it's really Unification Part 3. But I get why they did it from a marketing reason. I would have preferred it to just have a different title and have the episode exactly the same. But there you go. Or even like have the word unification in the title, but not call it unification part three. Just have it like reunification or the new unification. Oh, I don't know. Something. Final unification. I don't know. But to call it unification part three seems a little disingenuous because it doesn't directly continue on that plot line. And really the only continuation of the themes of that plot line from unification part one and two were the bits where the fracture lines between the Vulcans and the Romulans start to show a little bit. But there, that wasn't that much of the episode. So it's a, yeah, it just feels a little bit strange for the title. But it was a good episode and I did enjoy it. Let me know what you think. Um, as I said, I'm going to be on Trek Lads live stream tomorrow night. So do check that out. I'll leave the description. I'll leave the link in the description below. Join me and several other Trekkies with Trek Lad talking about this episode. And I will see you next week for another review. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>